Good morning. Um, I think that uh, some people have called for a national day of prayer today, Sunday the 15th, and I think we need to be in prayer. I th I, maybe we could be praying for a heat wave because I heard that the virus is susceptible to heat, and I don't know that those of us in Minnesota would uh, be upset if it got warmer, so we could do that. I, I do want to seriously focus you on the 40 days of prayer, and if you haven't been doing it, it's okay. You can catch up. So I would like you to look at the website or download the app, the Woodbury app, because you can get it there in its entirety and catch up, read through, get to the day we're on right now, uh, and continue to go day by day. And if you don't want to do that, if, if you can contact me, I'll get you a hard copy. All right, I'd, I'd like to pray before we start, before I start. God, we thank you uh, that you are in control. I thank you that you are always present with us uh, in good times and bad times, and that we can, uh, at any time of our lives, come to you, focus on your word, focus on what you have to say to us, uh, and then we could draw peace from that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in this series on Rebellious Bible, uh, Patrick has uh, said that we're going to let God's word defy our expectations and transform our lives. So I have one thing to, to remind you. If you remember Where's Waldo, all right? Um, if you remember Where's Waldo, the book Where's Waldo, uh, and you had, you know, a time looking for him, how did you search for Waldo? Did you search for him by just kind of scanning the page for his red and white sweater, or did you go inch by inch on that page to where you could find him? Uh, I actually researched this, and the study says that we have a peripheral function in our brain, and also we have a spotlight function. And they said that if you're looking at the book of Where's Waldo, you're doing both things at the same time. You're looking at him and in, in scanning for him in a broad way, but then you're also focusing in and seeing him. Uh, and this book, uh, this one says that there's one advertised five-minute challenges on every page. Uh, I have, if you could like look at this whole slide and see if you can see Where's Waldo, you may not be able to because of the video presence, uh, but that's okay. I'll give you a, another. If that's too hard, I have a little bit easier one here on this one. Uh, he's, he's there. He's, he's more upper left table but uh, if that's too hard then maybe you can find him on this one uh, okay I think we've got it now uh, my point of showing you where's Waldo is just as the books that Waldo is on every page uh, I believe that in our Bibles Jesus is on every page I know that that might not seem to you like uh, the the reality but I'll tell you I want to look at 2 Timothy 3:15. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus. So Paul says this to us, or to Timothy, and he says that from childhood you've been taught the Scriptures. Well, what are those Holy Scriptures? Old Testament. Uh, in the very next verse, in 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So in these two verses, Paul is telling his son in the faith, Timothy, that all scripture is inspired by God, all scripture is profitable for this, uh, and it's, it's what brings you to Jesus, it's what brings you to faith, and he's talking about the Old Testament. There are scriptures throughout the Bible that are like that. Do you remember Cliff Notes? Anybody get through high school using Cliff Notes? I, I was one of them. So uh, they actually have Cliff Notes on the Bible study. It started by some guy in Nebraska. I read about this. This is probably no big deal. But he bought the rights from a guy in Canada who had started it in Canada, and now it's gone everywhere. I guess now with the Internet, it's not as popular anymore. But Cliff Notes on the Bible. The Bible is a, a great piece of literature. It is, number one, the inspired Word of God. Uh, that is most important. 66 books written by 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years. So it's an amazing piece of literature. Um, they have a cliff notes on the Old Testament. Uh, and the main thing I want us to realize is that both covenants point us to Jesus. 
both of those. In fact, the New Testament may be the Cliff Notes version because you get, you know, the shorter version of Jesus and what he's done for us there. But both covenants, all of Scripture, tells us that. And, 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 and the Bible is very clear. And so one of the main points I want us to think about is that the Bible was written to point us to Jesus. I have a friend who lives in Israel and is a Messianic Jew, known him for a long time, 30 plus years. Uh, and he says that Genesis 1 through 4 is, teaches the gospel, and he says that everything after that is repetition. Uh, that would be hard for us to, to uh, agree with it sometimes, but I think when you stop and think about it, it talks about God's forgiveness. It talks about his love for his children. Uh, and so in some ways you can see that Genesis 1 through 4 with Adam and Eve, sin coming into the world and him forgiving them and, and allowing them to continue living on, that you can see there is a gospel message in that. What about the Passover lamb in Exodus chapter 12? Uh, that was the way Israel, the nation of Israel, is going to escape the bondage in Egypt. But it is also Jesus referred to as the Passover lamb because of his sacrifice. What about the suffering servant in Isaiah chapter 53? Uh, Bruce has been preaching, uh, teaching on Isaiah in the Bible classes. You get to Isaiah 53, there's this whole, whole chapter about the sacrifice of, of Jesus. Uh, and, and that's, again, in the Old Testament, pointing us to Jesus, pointing us toward Christ. What about Isaac in Genesis chapter 22? Abraham, Isaac's his son, Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac on the hill. Isaac is actually carrying the wood for the sacrifice up the hill. And people have drawn comparisons to Jesus, God's son, carrying the wooden cross up the hill of Calvary. If you read scripture as a whole, then the Bible is full of things like this. In fact, Jesus himself, when he's talking to Nicodemus, in John chapter 3, quotes a passage from Numbers uh, chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. So John 3, 14 and 15, Jesus says to Nicodemus, And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. So in that story, the nation of Israel had been unfaithful. God sent venomous snakes among them. The people got bit and then... God told Moses, put a snake on the top of a pole. If they look at that snake, they can be healed. Jesus draws a conclusion from that and says, I will be lifted up on a pole, a wooden cross, and if people look to me, they can receive healing as well. So scripture is full of this stuff. Um, and, and so one last scripture, we're, we're going to be in John today. John chapter 1, verse 45 says this, Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. So we read this New Testament and we think it's great, but the disciples during Jesus' time didn't have the New Testament. And so they're looking to the Old Testament to point them to Jesus. And that's what uh, Philip tells Nathaniel when after seeing Jesus says this is the person that that Moses and the prophets have told us about all right we're going to be in John chapter 5 for a while if you could follow along in John chapter 5 we're going to have a, a reading here John chapter 5 we're going to read verses 31 through 38 back to back I just want to set the scene this is like a court scene earlier in chapter 5 Jesus has healed someone on the Sabbath, which the Pharisees did not like. And then next, he calls God his father. And when he does that, they absolutely want to kill him. Verses 31 through 38. We'll read it all together. If I were to testify on my own behalf, my testimony would not be valid. But someone else is also testifying about me. And I assure you that everything he says about me is true. In fact... You sent investigators to listen to John the Baptist, and his testimony about me was true. Of course, I have no need of human witnesses, but I say these things so you might be saved. John was like a burning and shining lamp, and you were excited for a while about his message. But I have a greater witness than John. 
my teachings and my miracles. The Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they proved that he sent me. And the Father who sent me has testified about me himself. You have never heard his voice or seen him face to face, and you do not have his message in your hearts because you do not believe me, the one he sent to you. So it's like a court scene. Jesus calls all of these witnesses. He calls John the Baptist. He said, John the Baptist spoke about me, and yet you didn't really believe him. He calls next his, his works, his ministry, his miracles. And he said, those testify to me and to who I am. And then he says, God, the Father, testifies to me as well. Later in this passage, we'll, we'll see later, he actually calls uh, Scripture and he actually calls Moses as witnesses. But he's, he's defending himself to these Pharisees. Um, the next two verses, uh, oh, so I've got ahead of myself. So right here, here's these witnesses, John the Baptist, Jesus' work and ministry, and God that he calls. Now, these next two verses, Jesus gets very personal. So John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. The Pharisees are not bad people, but they do have a problem. The problem is they are just focused on Scripture. And they are so focused on their traditional views of Scripture and obedience to it that they have missed the Messiah. They have missed God's only Son who's coming there. And Jesus says, you're focusing on the Scriptures and you think they give you life, but they don't. I, I have life. You need to come to me. Um, so, I, one of the main points, it's easy to be attracted to Scripture as an exercise in intellectual brilliance. Uh, people do that all the time. I remember going to, many years ago, back in 19, <coughs> um, I, I went to Boise State University. I attended a class on the Reformation Movement. And the professor there, at the beginning of his class, in his introduction, he, he's kind of talking about some doctrines uh, in the early church, not early church, first century, but later, where some people believe in the popes and believe Peter was the first pope. And he says to the class, he says, did you know Peter was married? And he said, do you know how I know that? And the class is silent, and then I raised my hand and said, because the Bible says that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And this professor just got this look on his face like, I had just stolen his big point. I mean, he, he didn't know what to do. I think I must have been the first person in 10 years that had answered his question. So like Patrick talked about last week, our Bible knowledge may be lacking, but for, for our heritage, that's one of our strengths. So I, I think that's good. And yet we've got to make sure that we don't miss the main point as we're talking about that. Uh, in fact, Rabbi Hillel, one of the two famous, Patrick's talked about him, uh, one of the two most famous rabbis during this time. He said this, the more one studies the law, the more life he has gained for himself in the world to come. Paul actually argues against that in Romans chapter 7. Uh, he, Romans chapter 7 verse 10 says, Paul says, so I discovered that the law's commands which were supposed to bring life brought spiritual death instead. And that's one of the things that we need to remember about Scripture. The Bible doesn't save us. We can only be saved through Jesus Christ. And if we keep that first in our mind, then the study of the Bible will benefit us greatly. But if we get to looking at different interpretations and arguments and we miss the point of Jesus is the one, main point of Scripture, all of it, then we'll get off track and... and and, and we'll be missing the fact that we don't have spiritual life. We, we, are, we do have spiritual death, as Jesus was telling these Pharisees. All right, I want to go back to finish John chapter 5. A couple of the late verses in John chapter 5, 45 and 46. Jesus says, Yet it isn't I who will accuse you before the Father. Moses will accuse you. Yes, Moses, in whom you put your hopes. If you really believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. This really hit 
the Jewish leaders hard because not only are they focused on Scripture, they think Moses is their intercessor, like he was in history with the Israelites back in Exodus, back in you know, that time period. Uh, they feel like he's interceding for them all the time. And Jesus turns it around and says, no, he's not interceding for you. He is your accuser because he wrote about me, and yet you do not listen. Uh, you say you're following the scriptures, but you have missed the main point, which is me. All right, I want to go to Galatians 3. Uh, in Galatians 3, in verse 19, uh, Paul says, Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. And that's really the purpose of the law. It, and that's really what Paul says throughout his writings, is that the law does not bring life. It brings spiritual death because it shows us our sins, and we need something more than that. We need Jesus. And then in verse 23, 20, uh, we're going to read 23 and 24. There's a good analogy here Paul uses that I think we can uh, uh, wrap our minds around. Galatians 3, 23, Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. Paul uses this analogy about a guardian. The King James Version says schoolmaster. The Greek word is paedagogos, uh, and it's a compound word. The first part of the word is talking about a child. The second part of the word is talking about a leader, and so it basically comes out leader of a child. Back in the first century, uh, it was very common for wealthier people, I guess, to have a slave, maybe more slaves than one, but one slave would have one job, and that would be to take the sons to school. They would be their guardian that makes sure they gets to school. Uh, I know that my mom probably wanted a guardian for me to make sure I got to school and then make sure I got home. That was their job. They were also well-respected servant of the family. They were given... Uh, leeway to discipline the child but they that was their guard that was their job to be the guardian that takes the son to school wait there until he's done and to bring him home safely in that way protect him uh, but in our analogy Paul's analogy he's saying the law was the guardian to make sure that we get to the master teacher being shaped by scripture isn't first about knowledge, but it is about our heart, our, our heart. See, the problem with this is not the Jews' problem alone. I, I want to make that clear. Jesus, a lot of people read John chapter 5 or these verses, and they're saying that, you know, they, it's an anti-Semitism thing. That's not. Jesus is saying that the problem was just what they were doing. It wasn't, it's not the Jews' problem, but it is a problem for all people that if we focus too much on scripture and not enough on the story, the point of it, then we're going to miss the point. All right, last, last scripture that we're going to use this morning is in Mark chapter 8. So we'll go there. Mark chapter 8, I'm going to read 27 through 29. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, Who do people say I am? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the, of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? And Peter replied, You are the Messiah. When he says, Who do you say I am? Peter has moved from believing Jesus is some sort of rabbi to some sort of prophet to who is this man to he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God, the Savior. Um, and now we need to know that man. Why does Peter know that? Because Peter has not just seen it in Scripture, but he has been with Jesus. He knows him. There's a personal relationship there. We can study scripture all we want, but we have to have that personal relationship with Jesus. Mark has spent eight chapters or so of Jesus in his ministry. And now that Jesus understands that his disciples understand he is the Messiah, 
Now he's going to spend the next eight chapters on his way back to Jerusalem and telling him everything that the Messiah must do. Now that he's got that clear that he is Messiah, now he's going to tell him what the Messiah must do. All right. After this, um, that, that, that's when he, Peter, uh, look at the next verse. Mark 8, verse 32. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. So that's when, so Peter's doing well. He says, you are the Messiah. Now Peter's struggling because Jesus says he's going to have to die. He's going to have to be killed. And now Peter's traditions, Peter's teachings, the things he is comfortable with says no. And he takes Jesus, Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him for what he's saying. Uh, and then Jesus, of course, rebukes him back. Uh, it's, it's because we're, we're blinded by the, sometimes we see what we're trained to see. Peter was trained through scripture to see that the Messiah was going to be something different than Jesus actually was. And so that's why he did it. So there's, you know, there's different illustrations. I've, I've heard of illustrations where scientists will flash two pictures, w- one picture on each eye at the same time. One will be a baseball player, one will be a bullfighter. And then they'll show that, they'll flash that picture to people and say, what picture did you see? And people from North America will say a baseball player and or, or United States, I guess. And then people from Mexico would say, I saw a bullfighter. We're trained, we see what we're trained to see. Peter saw what he was trained to see, and it wasn't exactly the true picture of the Messiah and of Jesus. We have to be careful in that uh, when we're reading Scripture. All right, uh, in this same passage later in verse 34, uh, wait, okay, so, so what my point? We must pray and read Scripture anew to learn what Jesus is saying to us. We can't just Focus on our traditional reading of of a passage, traditional teaching of a passage. We have to train ourselves to say when we're reading God's word, we have to try and read it anew. And then God will be able to give us the word he wants to give us. Then in verse 34, Jesus calls uh, them together. He says, then calling the crowd to join his disciples He said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. So not only is Jesus talking to his disciples, he calls the whole crowd together and says, come here. And he tells the whole crowd, you've got to do these things. You've got to, number one, deny yourself. That's not a part-time job and it's not part-time effort. We have to figure out what that means to deny ourselves. Secondly, Jesus says, take up a cross. And that, that will involve sacrifice, maybe danger, uh, and it may involve a willingness to suffer. Jesus commands us to do that. And then the third thing Jesus commands is to follow the way of Jesus, follow in his way. Not your own chosen way, not the way I want to follow, with the map that I want to follow of my life. I've mapped out my life. This is what I want it to look, at, look like. No, it's Jesus says you've got to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Uh, Winding down here, one last verse and a couple of points. Um, My last verse, I lost it, so if if you've got another slide, go ahead and change it. But if if not, oh, there's not another one. You're right. That is my last slide. All right. John 5, 24 says, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. If you're banking on your knowledge and your of scripture and your obedience to it, then you may be just like the people that Jesus was speaking to. We can become so lost in varying interpretations of scripture that we miss the presence and the will of God. Scripture wasn't written to give us a pattern. It was written to point us to Jesus. Third, we must know Jesus like Peter did, not just know about him, but have that personal relationship with him. And lastly, we can be certain of our salvation because of Jesus. Accepting him, making him Lord, which is repentance, 
choosing his way, which leads to baptism and the gift of the Holy Spirit, those are the things that Scripture wants us to have by pointing us to Jesus.